So we're going to talk today about more things that happen at, with light. Um, this is going to be covering sections 3.6 and 3.7. So the first thing to introduce is this notion of rays. So not like sting rays, but like light rays. So so often we don't really care about what's happening. So so often you'll have a you'll have a source of light. And then oh, where's my where'd the video go? Oh. Uh I don't know why I can't see my own video. But anyway, often you'll have a source of light and then you'll have a detector of light. And we don't usually care what the light is doing elsewhere. We only care about how the light gets from the source to the detector. Now, in general, in general, from a source, light will travel out in a sphere. Light travels perpendicular to constant phase planes. Now, a, a constant phase plane just means a plane at which all of the light waves on that plane have the same phase. So pictorially, that would be like if you have a, a source a constant phase plane, plane being really it should be constant phase surfaces. Yeah, let's let's write it as surfaces. So the surfaces in this case are the spheres. And all of these surfaces have constant phase. Trying to draw them. Oh, God, that's so bad. And so the fact that the light travels perpendicular to constant phase surfaces means that the light is traveling at if you were to measure the direction of light traveling at that point, it would be traveling out. At this point, it'd be traveling that direction and so on. So light is always perpendicular to these surfaces of constant phase. And so you can figure out what surfaces form this or like what regions form the surfaces of constant phase by just asking, okay, well, what is the phase at this point? What is the phase at that point? And, and here I'm talking about total phase, just like when we were computing total phase difference, here I'm talking about total phase. So two pi x or or 2 pi x over lambda plus 2 pi ft plus the phase constant. When that number is constant for different positions of x and or for different positions x, or rather when it, yeah, for, yeah, when, when, when that, at, at a given point in time, when that, when that expression is constant, all of the points x that make that expression constant would form a constant phase surface. So this is just like a level set. Um, and so because the wave travels in three dimensions and propagates outwards, these generally form spheres for light. But it doesn't have to. Like, for example, for a laser beam, it would form like planes. Um, anyway, so the point is, is as a viewed as a wave, light travels in all directions at once, right? Assuming, again, that the source is spherical or that the source emits spherical, spherically symmetric waves. But we can shift our perspective to that from just the source to the perspective of viewing the source as it relates to the observer. If, if we just view it as the, how the source relates to the observer, well, then the direction of light, the only direction of light that we care about is the direction from the source to the observer. So this narrows the direction of light. The direction of light travel um, to a line. Sorry, I need to adjust this. And that line that goes from the source to the observer is called the light ray. And so in this picture, it would be like putting an observer here. It's marked with like a weird eyeball. So the light ray would be just this line. And in particular, it should be perpendicular to all of these constant phase surfaces. This, this line is a light ray. Now, keep in mind, a light ray is just an abstract idea. It's not like, like there is no such thing as a physical light ray because light travels in all directions. But if you're only concerned with what light gets to the observer, then you can imagine that light behaves like a ray, like a light ray. Now, this perspective is super powerful because it lets us understand things like reflection and refraction. So let's talk about reflection of rays. Because we know that if you shine a laser beam, and by the way, like a laser is, would be a good, a good approximation of a light ray. 
you shine a laser beam at a, you know, at a pool, some of the some of the laser beam is going to go into the pool at some angle, and some of it will reflect off at a different angle. And we can now understand using this perspective of the light ray, we can tr we can calculate um, what directions those go in. So, <clears throat> as far as reflection is concerned, we are interested in the angle, or we are interested in relating the incoming angle to the outgoing angle of a reflection for a light ray. Now we know that waves generally are going to reflect off of any interface uh, off of any medium change. So anytime the like if, if you have a light if you have light that goes from air if you have light in air and then it interacts with say water at the interface between the air and the water there will be a reflection. And also there will be some transmission. We know this about waves that waves generally will reflect and transmit through any interface. Uh, and th th that's generally true. And the way that we handle this is we we retreat back to Huygens principle. Um, so I'm going to show you a quick set of diagrams. I'm just going to walk you through that through it because it, it's much better for me to just show you these diagrams than to try to draw them myself. So let me show you these diagrams. This is, by the way, this is in section 3.6 for the diagrams that I'm about to show you. Diagrams, diagrams. There we go. All right. Let me show my screen. Um, all right. So. The picture is as follows. So you have, you have an incoming plane of light rays. Maybe it's from some source on the left here. So it's emitting waves in a circular manner, right? Or in a spherical manner. This is a two-dimensional representation. But it emits waves spherically, symmetrically, like, like most things do. But then there's a surface of reflection, this, this dotted line. And we're wondering, well, what happens when uh, <clears throat> what happens when the wave interacts with that dotted line? Well, if that if that dotted line isn't if that dotted line is just imaginary, if there's no reflection there, then we can just find what uh, we we can just use Huygens principle to figure out how the wave propagates beyond that dotted line, and that's what this middle bit is. So we draw that we draw our Huygens points along the dotted line, and then we can figure out from the constructive interference of those new wave fronts what the propagating wave is past that line. But we can do the same thing for a reflection. It's just in the case of the reflection, the propagating waves, instead of, prop instead of creating wave fronts to the right, continuing on to the right, we know the reflection goes in the opposite direction. So in that case, we would get propagating wave fronts to the left. So here we have the same light source, but this time it's incident on a reflecting surface. We have the same Huygens waves, but now because it's reflecting off, we only care about the wave fronts that result from the uh, waves propagating to the left. So you can see that you get another spherical-ish um, wave front propagating from right, uh, from right to left. So what does that look like? Well, so if we were to, uh, if we were to imagine that that light, that that reflected wave comes instead from something else, from something beyond the reflected wave. So imagine like looking in a mirror, it's almost like the light that you see from the mirror comes from the other side of the mirror. So here we're trying to imagine where would that light source have to be coming from? Like what position in space would that light source have to be coming from to produce the reflected wave? So here we know the reflected wave produces these spherical like, uh, I don't know, you can't see my, um, no, you can't see it. Uh, I wish I could draw. On the left, we can see that the, that the reflected waves in red have a spherical shape. So we can guess what those waves must virtually come from, i.e. if those waves were not the result of a reflection, but instead the result of a wave just passing by, we can figure out where the source must have been. In particular, on the right-hand side, you can see in light red, you can see that the reflected waves behave exactly as if instead of the, um, the reflecting surface, you just had another copy of your source on the other side of your mirror. Now, 
like I said, this is a virtual thing. This is not a thing that actually exists. There isn't another light source there. It's just the light waves, the, the reflected light waves behave as if there were. And so we can use that to figure out what direction rays move in, or sorry, what direction waves bounce in when they reflect. So let's, let's instead look at it from the perspective of the observer. If we say, put the observer here at the top, uh, that, that little camera slash eyeball thing, we know that these waves from the red source are going to be the waves that hit us. We're imagining that you can't see any of the blue sources. Maybe you have a really narrow field of view, right? So these waves up top aren't go the waves up top by the eye, the blue waves up top by the eye aren't going to trigger our detector. So in that case, the only waves that the detector detects, that that observer sees, are the waves that are reflected. And that observer sees those waves as if they were coming from this virtual, and I'm using the word virtual on purpose, by the way, from this virtual image, this virtual source. It's the, the, the direction that the waves are traveling in are as if they originated on the right-hand side in light red. And so we can figure out that direction um, just by some simple geometry. In particular, we find, as, as you can probably see here, and I'll write it down in a minute, we find that the light ray, if a light ray is coming in to a surface at some angle, then the light ray bounces off at the same angle. So let me uh, let me write that down for you guys in terms of light rays, or draw a picture and show show it to you in terms of in terms of light rays. Um, here we go. Right. So the end result of treating of treating this with Huygens principle is the following is the law of reflection, which tells us how light rays, this is rays from one direction bouncing off a surface and then going to a sort, going to an observer, change angle. And this is probably the most intuitive law that, you're, that, you're, that we're going to see here. So this relates the incoming angle, the angle of incidence. That's just that's an official name, angle of incidence. It's a technical name. Equals the outgoing angle, which is the angle of reflection. So that is. The picture looks something like this. You have your interface. You have a perpendicular to your interface. It's often useful to draw these perpendiculars. Let's say that you have your incoming, your incoming angle, sorry, your uh, incoming ray, also known as the incident ray. And it has some angle. It makes some angle with the perpendicular theta i, i for incident. Then the outgoing ray, the reflected ray, has an outgoing angle theta sub r, the, the, the theta of the reflected ray. And the law of reflection states that theta sub i equals theta sub r. So this just tells us that if, if you shoot a beam, if you shoot a light ray at a really, really shallow angle to the interface, it'll, it'll bounce off with a really, really shallow angle. If you shoot it really straight down, it'll come up really straight up. That's That shouldn't be surprising. I think you guys all probably have that uh, intuition developed already. Um, so, but but that's that's the basic gist of it. And so, how can we view this as a light ray? Well, imagine that you had a source here. Well, if you put a if you put a uh, an observer here, well, then the angles will be different. Whereas if you put a source here, you'll get a different angle. So, so the angle that you observe, rather, um, <clears throat> it, th th this is kind of backwards. We started off saying, look, these rays depend on where you put the observer. But now we're just imagining these rays are their own thing. And the observer, where the observer sees these rays, depends on the, on the angle that the rays are going out at. And for the, for the most part, that's how we're going to treat rays going forward. We're going to treat them as a real thing. And then the observer is just where the ray, where the ray ends after it does its business, after it reflects and so on. 
But at the end of the day, I mean, we, all of this still does rely on these things being actual waves. And that's why I used Huygens principle, like spherical waves. That's why I used Huygens principle to, to illustrate that. So <clears throat> that tells us what happens when a, uh, a wave reflects off of an interface. We know that that, that that happens, waves do reflect. But more than that, we also know that waves transmit through surfaces. And in particular, we know that their speed changes. So this notion of waves transmitting through different media gets us to the topic of refraction. So we know that the only time waves will reflect or change in any way due to an interface is when the medium changes. And the, when the medium changes, what that means is that the speed of light is changing. So in particular, <clears throat> we can ask the question, what happens when a ray changes medium? Well, we know, as I just said, sorry, I got a little bit backwards. We know that the speed changes. And so the, we can then ask, what are the consequences of the speed of the wave changing? And you might say, oh, well, it just travels slower. And that is true, but there's a little bit more than that because these waves are not just rays. And that's the important part. That's why we have to actually realize that these are still like waves, they're, they're still three. They're still three-dimensional waves. Because they still have, they're still three-dimensional waves. The wave fronts tell us the direction of propagation, and so if the wave fronts change direction, then the then the direction of propagation changes direction, and hence the rays are going to change direction. So in fact, we actually do find that the rays change direction. They bend or change direction. Now, we're again going to use Huygens principle to understand this. So, <clears throat> and I'm going to show you another, I'm going to show you an animation this time. So, uh, let me pull this up. Here it is. These animations are excellent. OK, so well, let's wait for this to restart. OK, so we have our, we have our wave fronts. This is a plane wave. They're emitting Huygens waves. But then notice that by the time the, the left side of the wave front touches the interface, the, the, <clears throat> the Huygens points that it emits are now slower. Notice the distance between the uh, Huygens, the Huygens uh, sorry, the wave fronts is smaller, whereas the ones that haven't yet gotten in are still traveling at whatever their speed is. And so the end result is you get a bending of planes. And notice, <clears throat> I wish I could pause this. Um, yeah. So, so the, the point is, is that because the waves are traveling slower, they cover less distance um, <clears throat> in the same amount of time. And so they, they, they're not able to move down as fast as the ones that are still outside the interface. And so you end up with a wave that go, that was going like this. Well, the part that's closest to the interface isn't going as fast anymore. So it bends up, and the and you end up with the whole thing moving down at a different angle. Now, in some cases, uh, yeah, but I don't have a mouse accessible for this tablet right now, unfortunately. Um, in this case, or in some cases, the wave will actually bend away. This is just an example of when the wave bends forward. Now, uh, or bends, uh, bends down rather than up. It can happen both ways. But the point is, and, and I'll show you a diagram for this in a minute, the point is, is that the amount of speed change dictates the change in the direction. And here we're visualizing these wave fronts as planar because that's the easiest way to visualize these things. This does work for, sort, for spherical waves, but it's a little bit more complicated because uh, the, the geometry gets messier. So, now that we've established that uh, the waves indeed do bend, let's try to figure out how much they bend, or how much the rays bend, rather. So let me just write that down. So the amount of speed change dictates the amount of change in direction. So hopefully this diagram will make sense. So imagine that we have, and I'm going to use basically the same diagram, but I'm just going to 
slow it down. So imagine that we have our plane, our plane coming in like this. So we have an incident plane that hits our surface. Uh, yeah, let's make it roughly that angle. So this is our incident plane or our incident wave. And it's traveling, you know, this way at some speed, the speed of light divided by the index of refraction. Let's make this n1. So that's, by the way, this is how we write the index of refraction. We'll often have like a barrier and then we'll have n1 up top and n2 down below. Those are the index of indices of refraction for the medium that we're interested in. And uh, just for this picture, we're going to assume that n2 is uh, greater than n1. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and that's just because I want the picture to make sense. But like this, this analysis still works. It just changes what the picture looks like. So, we have our incident wave. Now, the distance, this distance here, let's draw a right angle. That distance, well, how long does it take for that distance to be covered by the, by the plane wave? Because it'll take some time to travel all the way down for the, for the top rightmost edge to travel. How long will it take? Well, that's pretty easy. We know the speed that it's traveling at. It's the speed of light divided by the index of refraction times, and we know, and, and we can write it in terms of how long it takes to get there. Sorry, we're trying to figure out how far away it is, how far it has to travel. Basically, we want to use geometry on this triangle, so we want to figure out that distance. So if we, so we can write that distance in terms of the speed and its time. In particular, that triangle, that leg of the triangle has length c times t, where t is the time, divided by n1. And I'm going to uh, label this uh, this angle theta one. <clears throat> um, similarly, this angle is also theta one. These are just perpendicular to the uh, to our original wave. So now, in the same amount of time that this part of the wave gets down to the interface. How far does the second wave travel? Well, <clears throat> we know that, uh, <clears throat> how do I want to say this? Well, we know it's going to travel some distance. CT divided by N1 is that, yeah, that's distance. Speed times time divided by number is distance. Yeah, this is just speed times the distance times the time is a distance, right? Um, so how long so so in the same amount of time, how far does our other wave travel? Well, uh, our other wave might travel at some some other angle where we haven't yet figured that out. Let's say that's traveling at that angle. Well, in that same amount of it, it, it travels a different distance in a same in the same amount of time. So that that distance would be c times t over n2. That's the distance that this point on the wave front travels in the second medium. And the reason they travel different distances is because they're moving at different speeds. Now let's call this angle theta 2. I'm going to call this number L. And so then the question is, so if, if these distances occur over the same amount of time, well, we can draw another triangle here. And by the way, um, the point is, is that our, our ray is, is going to be perpendicular. So here we have our incident wave traveling this way, and then here our incident wave is traveling that way, or our transmitted wave is traveling that way. So the, so the wave is, the, the ray is bending, but we're trying to work out what direction it's, or how much it's bending in. Uh, this is again a right angle. So now we can just use some trig to solve for these angles theta one and theta two. That's what we're going to do. So, <clears throat> by the way, um, as we can see from this, uh, diagram, when the distance traveled is greater on the top than it is on the bottom, that means that the wave will trap, the wave will bend towards, started off going this way. I'm just drawing a quick diagram. The wave bends towards the perpendicular, right? The angle that the angle from the perpendicular gets smaller. And that's because this wave travel or the, the top of the wave traveled further then the bottom, then the uh, part of the wave that's already in the interface. And so the, uh, the plane surface tilts up. It's not, this, it's not perpendicular to 
this incident plane way or a uh, plane. So that's all to say, we can draw a nice conclusion without, without even doing any calculations. By the way, the reason we know that this leg of the triangle is smaller than this leg is because CT is the same in both cases, but N2 is bigger than N1. So CT divided by N2 is smaller than CT divided by N1. So the conclusion here, and this is something that's important to remember, it's that light passing from a slow medium, sorry, from a fast medium, passing from a fast medium. So in, in this example, this would be N1 is fast and N2 is slow because uh, the, the wave travels more slowly in the second medium. So light passing from a fast medium to a slow medium bends toward the perpendicular, the perpendicular being perpendicular to the interface. Similarly, light passing from from slow to fast, a slow medium to a fast medium, bends away from the perpendicular. And in that case, if it's traveling to a fast medium, then this leg of the triangle would be longer. And so the angle would be greater than the incident angle. And so it bends away. That would be the case where it does something like this. And now we can figure out exactly how much using the, uh, the diagram that I drew above. So we want to find the relationship between these angles. Uh, let me get rid of this. Between theta 1 and theta 2. Because theta 1, this is the incident. This is effectively the incident angle, right? That is the, that is the direction of that ray. Theta 2 is the transmitted angle. So we want to find those angles. We want to relate them to each other. So I'm just going to draw some triangles. I'm going to blow them up just that way. Then we have a little bit more to look at. So here, our triangles look something like this. So we have a triangle here, triangle here, or legs of triangles that way. This angle here is theta. Sorry, this angle here is theta 1. It's a right angle. That's a terrible triangle. I'm sorry. This distance, I'm just going to call L, that length doesn't actually matter. It's just a number. But the point is, is it's shared by both angles or by both triangles. So because this angle is theta 1, you can use some standard trig to figure out that this angle is also theta 1. Um, basically, it's the, uh, well, this is the supplement or complement. And so because there's a right angle there, the other one has to be the same angle again. Um, right, so that angle is theta 1. And then this distance over here is c times t divided by n1. And so from this triangle, we see that sine of theta 1 is equal to c times t over n1 time or divided by l, or in particular, n1 times sine of theta 1 is equal to c times t divided by l. I just moved the n1 to the other side. OK, what about the, what about the other triangle? Well, the other triangle has the same length, but it has a different angle. So let's draw it like this. something like that. This angle here is theta 2, which means that this angle over here is theta 2. This is, again, L. And the length here is c times t divided by n2. So we can do the same sort of calculation. We get that the sine of theta 2 is equal to c times t divided by n2 divided by L. Or putting it another way, n2 times sine of theta 2 is equal to ct divided by L. Now. The point is, is we can combine these two equations. They're both equal n1 sine 1 theta, or sine theta 1, and n2 sine theta 2 are both equal to ct divided by l. So we can combine these, and we find that those two things are equal. We get that n1 times sine of theta 1 is equal to n2 times sine of theta 2. This is Snell's law, also known as the law of refraction. So the picture then is just simplified. If you have a wave, if you have your perpendicular, you have your wave coming in. 
this way, or not wave, your ray coming in. This angle is theta one. Say this angle here is theta two. Then Snell's law tells us what that what the relationship is between those waves, where n1 and n2 are the indices of refraction. So the relationship between those waves just depends on the on the relationship between the indices of refraction. For example, if you know n1, n2, and, and theta one, you can solve for theta two, and you know you can rearrange it however you want. Um, this tells us how much it bends, and that's exactly what we asked for. We wanted to know how much does the wave actually waves coming in like this, it ends up going like this, or it's coming in like this, it ends up going like this. And this will tell us, like, it, it, it'll tell us, depending on how n1 and n2 relate to each other, it'll tell us whether the angle theta2 is bigger or smaller than theta1. And indeed, you'll find that um, <clears throat> if, the, uh, if the wave goes from a fast medium, i.e. if n1 is smaller than n2, that means that sine of theta2 should be smaller than sine of theta one. If sine of theta two is smaller than sine of theta one, that means that theta two is smaller than theta one. That is, the, the ray bends inward and vice versa. You can do the same sort of analysis for when n two is greater than n one, which means that it's going from a slow medium to a fast medium. Okay, so that, so that, tell, so that covers two things. That tells us first how waves reflect off of, it, off of an interface. That tells us the direction of the reflected wave. And Snell's law tells us how the wave refracts or passes through, transmits through, uh, through the interface. By the way, the language, is, the language that's used is we talk about refraction being when a wave bends as a result of interacting with an, an interface. So in this case, the wave is refracting because it's changing its medium and it's bending. Um, <clears throat> now, there's a strange thing that arises as a result of Snell's law. So, and it's called total internal reflection. By the way, there are some uh, examples at the end of um, th there are some examples of Snell's law that I that I linked to in the lecture notes. So take a look. So total internal reflection, right? And this is just a consequence of Snell's law. So just as a quick reminder from Trig, the magnitude of the sine of an angle is always less than or equal to one. And so you might think that you get a paradox. For example, if, if n1 is say two and uh, n2 is say one, maybe it's passing through some like some special type of glass that has an index of refraction that's n2 or that, that's two and it's going into the vacuum which has index of refraction one. And let's say it's trying to go at an angle of 45 degrees. Well, then you might say, okay, what angle does it exit what angle does it exit the interface at? Using Snell's law, so it comes in at a 45 degree angle, what angle does it refract at? Well, we can just apply Snell's law. Snell's law says that uh, n1 sine theta one should be equal to n2 sine theta two. And so we can plug numbers in, we get two times the sine of 45 degrees, for the sine of 45 degrees is square root two over two. This should be equal to the sine of theta one. Now. This just gives us the square root of two, and that should be equal to the sine of theta one. Sorry, sine of theta two. But this is impossible because the square root of two is like 1.4 ish, and sine of theta two can never be that big. It's always the magnitude is always less than one. So something went wrong here. There is no angle theta two that makes this statement true. So is Snell's law wrong? Well, not quite. Snell's law only applies when there is indeed any sort of refraction. The, the resolution to this potential paradox is that in this case, all light rays that are coming in at this angle of 45 degrees reflect, um, reflect and none transmit. So this is to say, because there isn't an angle that makes Snell's law true in order for the light rays to pass through and bend, that means that none of the light passes through and bends. Just 0% zero, zero of the light passes through the interface. And so by energy conservation, you must, it must be the case that all of the light rays have to reflect off of that interface, which is allowed because at every interface, light waves both reflect and transmit. In this case, light waves only reflect it's not possible for them to transmit. And so this is 
what's known as total internal reflection. It means all of the light waves are reflected internally. They never, they never change medium. So if you start off with light in a medium, it will just bounce off of it and stay inside that medium, hence internal. So when can this happen? Well, this can happen. Let me write that down. So this can happen uh, when the angle can't bend enough. Can't bend far enough, rather. Away from the normal. So that is, in cases where the light ray would try to come in, you have your light ray coming in. If it's going to a, if it's going to a faster medium, it will try to bend away from the normal. But if the if it's coming in at, at a sufficiently steep angle, it'll try to bend away from the normal, and it won't be able to bend far enough. I.e., there's not an angle that you can take the sign of that gets you the value you need to get. Um, and so this only occurs bends light rays only bend away from the normal. They can always bend towards the normal. That's never an issue. That'll never, that'll never give us a problem of total internal reflection. This only occurs when the ray goes from a slow medium The reason why this happens is because when the ray goes from a fast medium to a slow medium, the ray just bends towards the uh, the ray bends towards the normal. And the way to see this is just that if n1 sine theta one is equal to n2 sine theta two, if n1 is smaller than n2, i.e., um, if it's if n1 is uh, if, yeah, if, if the place, if the medium where the light ray starts is a fast medium, i.e. it has a smaller index of refraction than the place that it's trying to go, then that means that n1 divided by n2 is less than 1, i.e. The index, the index of refraction of the first medium is smaller than the index of refraction of the second medium. And so that implies that n1 over n2 sine of theta 1 is equal to sine of theta 2. Sorry, that should be a sine of theta 2 there. And because sine of theta 1 is always less than 1, and n1 over n2 is less than 1, then it's there's always a possibility of finding an angle theta 2 that matches this. Just because um, you're not increasing, so you're, not, you're not multiplying sine of theta 1 by something bigger than 1 that will increase it and potentially ruin Snell's law. This is why this happens. This, or rather, this is why this doesn't happen in the fast to slow case. Um, so we can, I, I can depict this uh, pictorially, I guess that's how, you, that's how one depicts things. Um, but I can talk about this, this notion of a critical angle. So the critical angle is the angle that the incoming ray has to be at so that it just exactly totally internal, internally reflects. If, if it were to come in any steeper, then it could refract. And if it were to come in any shallower, then it will internally reflect. There's a special angle where that happens, right? Because for example, 45 degrees is too steep. You get total internal reflection in this case. If you, if you decrease the angle, you made it more and more vertical, eventually you would get to a place where it would transmit. For example, if you plugged in 90 degrees, then N1 times sine of, no, sorry, not 90 degrees. If you plugged in zero degrees, that's the angle measured from the vertical, then N1 times sine of zero is just zero. And so then theta two could be zero. So there's there's got to be a place in the middle between straight vertical and some angle down low, where it's at exactly the right angle where it will tra where um, where if you go any lower it will reflect and if you go any higher some of it will still transmit. So that's called the critical angle. The critical angle theta c is the required incoming angle. Um, so that the outgoing angle is 90 degrees. So the picture here is as follows. You have, our, you have your interface. You have your perpendicular. 
And let's say that you have a slow medium. Sit, call it N2, and a fast medium up here. We want to see what happens, or this phenomenon only occurs when you go from a slow medium to a fast medium. So let's start with an incoming ray. Can't draw a straight line for my life. Incoming ray has an angle, call it theta C. So when that angle is theta C, that means that the outgoing angle, the angle that would pass through, is precisely 90 degrees. So the outgoing ray is precisely 90 degrees. This would be the outgoing. Outgoing meaning transmitted. And then there's, this, then there's the typical reflected ray as well, which also has the same angle from the law of reflection. Uh, to be clear, by the way, this, this outgoing ray or the transmitted ray is also known as the refracted ray, refracted and reflected. So there's always two rays, um, or almost always two rays. When, an, when a ray is incident on an interface, there's a refracted ray and a reflected ray. Sometimes it'll be called a transmitted ray and a reflected ray, and so on. So you can see that if you, if you brought this angle down anymore, well, if you brought this angle down anymore, this refracted ray can't bend up. It can't leave the interface because by definition, it's a ray that's traveling through the second medium. And if it were to bend up, then it wouldn't be in that second medium anymore. So there just, uh, there just is no refracted ray if you were to bend this incident ray down any further. And so in that case, all of the light is reflected. And so you can see that this can, well, actually I'll explain, I'll give an example of why this is useful, but let me just talk a little bit more about generalities. So when the incoming theta sub i is greater than the critical angle, this says that all light is reflected. This is what it means to be totally internal, internally reflected. Um, so we need to actually, so we can actually solve for theta c. We can find this critical angle. Like, is it 10 degrees? Is it 20 degrees? Whatever. So we want to find the angle theta c so that the outgoing angle, so theta c is an incoming angle, the incident angle. We want to find theta c so that the outgoing angle is exactly 90 degrees. So to do that, we can just plug it into Snell's law. We want that the incoming angle is theta c, and the outgoing angle is 90 degrees. Sorry. Um, here, incoming means it's the wave. It's the angle that's Incoming is the angle that starts in the slower medium, N2. So it's going to look a little bit backwards. So we have N1 sine of 90 degrees. That is the wave. That is the angle of the wave that's the outgoing wave, the wave that's transmitted, or the, the ray that's transmitted, because this has index of refraction N1. So, so in Snell's law, you pair the index of refraction with the weight with the ray in that medium. So here we want 90 degrees in the index of refraction N1. We want that to be equal to. N2, that's, this is the incident ray, times the sine of the angle theta c, the critical angle. And now we can just solve. Um, so in this case, sine of 90 degrees is just 1. So this is N1 divided by N2, or rather sine of theta c is equal to N1 divided by N2. And so we get that our critical angle is the arc sine, not arc 10 arc sine of n1 divided by n2. And a, another way to see that this critical angle, that, that this phenomenon doesn't occur when you're going from a fast medium to a slow medium is that when you're, when you're in a fast medium, n1 is, sorry, when you're going, uh, yeah, so in, a, so in a slow medium, n2 is greater than n1. And so uh, when you go from slow to fast, oh no, okay. Uh, this formula is not a good formula. Okay, I'm going to label this a different way. Um, I'm going to label this one N2. This one N1. Sorry about that. I know I'm slipping it. Uh, so then I can rewrite this. 
So we have N1 sine of theta C equals N2 sine of 90 degrees. And then you have sine of, yeah, okay. Now And now this is just equal to uh, N2 over N1. And so that's arc sine of N2 divided by N1. I just wanted to make that, uh, make that change so that N1 is the medium that it starts in. Uh, because if you see this formula, you might say, oh, N1, one means that's where it's starting and two means that's where it's going. So I just had to change this. So now if the fast medium N2, that means it has a smaller index of refraction, then N2 divided by N1 is less than one. And the arc sine of a number less than one is well-defined. However, if you try to take the arc sine of something greater than one, arc sine of say six, you get something that's not defined. And that can happen when N2 is greater than N1. And that would imply, if N2 was greater than N1, that would imply that N2 is slower than N1. The, media, the second medium is slower than the first medium. So in the case where you're going from a faster medium to a slower medium, there just is no critical angle. It, it just doesn't exist. And so that's why this total internal reflection phenomenon doesn't occur in that case. Now you might say, okay, why do we care about any of this anyway? Well, it turns out that this property is actually remarkably useful for modern data transmission. In particular, this phenomenon is used in fiber optics. So in fiber optics, you have, you have a tube made of glass, which has an index of refraction, say N1 equals, I don't know, 1.6, something like that. And then outside of the glass, you have air. This is, this is a really simple example, N2 equals one. And so if you shoot light down at a sufficiently steep angle, if you shoot light in a laser beam, well, you might say, oh, well, some of the light's going to escape and you'll lose data. But if you make your glass out of sufficiently, uh, or if your glass has a sufficiently high index of refraction, what'll end up happening is your light beam comes in, bounces off. It'll pass through, bounce off again. And then you don't lose intensity, your beam doesn't stay spread out or doesn't spread out, it stays within your fiber optics. And so by energy conservation, the brightness at one end is the same as the brightness at the other. So you can, you can transmit light over a very, very long distance by using total internal reflection because none of the light is lost. In the real world, some of the light is lost, but a very small fraction of it is. And it's lost to like heat and things like that um, and non-perfect transmission. But so this is super useful because we can, you can transmit data this way very, very quickly. You can transmit data significantly faster using fiber optics than you can using standard electronics because light travels very fast. And even in glass, it travels you know, 200,000 meters per second. Um, sorry, uh, 200,000 kilometers per second-ish. So that's enough to go around the earth you know, 10 times in a second, uh, no, five times in a second, just through fiber optics, whereas electronics would take orders of milliseconds um, to, or uh, orders of seconds rather to travel that same distance. So um, this is a super useful way to transmit data, transmit, um, yeah, ba basically to transmit data. Um, and that's why, you know, like hedge funds and things like that use fiber optic cables to connect to, you know, the, like the New York Stock Exchange and so on, because they want the fastest possible time between the data, between the data at the New York Stock Exchange, sorry, they want the fastest possible transmission of data between them and the Stock Exchange. So this is a really useful phenomenon and being able to know what direction or uh, what angle this occurs at for what materials, well, you can make more and more efficient fiber optics with, with higher and higher or with slower and slower, um, Fiber, op fiber optic materials. Now that's not the only phenomenon that occurs for, uh, that occurs as a result of refraction. There's other phenomena as well. Um, so let's talk about another phenomenon involving um, refraction. And this is the phenomenon known as, oh, by the way, there are some examples about total internal reflection as well. So check those out as well. This is a phenomenon called dispersion. So dispersion is <clears throat> basically the phenomenon where light bends different amounts depending on its wavelength. So I'll get to that in a minute, but, uh, oh no. Oh no, never mind. that's fine. So 
But to understand this, we have to understand the index of refraction. So let's ask the question, what determines the index of refraction in a medium? I.e., why is the index of refraction glass like 1.6? Why is the index of refraction air 1.004 or whatever? It turns out that I don't know the answer. To, I mean, I, I know roughly the answer to that, but it's really hard to actually calculate. And so I'm not going to tell you what the answer is. This is a hard ENM question. It depends on quantum mechanics and so on and so forth. Well, yeah, it depends on quantum mechanics, basically, and crystal structures and so on. It's a hard question. I say hard, I mean like research level hard. But what we can do empirically is we can observe that the index of refraction of a medium depends on the frequency at with the frequency with that you measure it with. Index of refraction. Like the way that you measure the index of refraction, by the way, is you shine a light through it and then you see how much it bends, right? And then you use Snell's law. The index of refraction depends on the, on the frequency measuring with, frequency that you measure the index of refraction with. Which is to say, if you shine blue light into blue being a high frequency, if you shine blue light into, say, an object that you're trying to measure the index of refraction for, it will bend a different amount than if you shine, say, red light, because the measurement of the index of, ref of refraction depends on the frequency of the light that you use to measure it. And experimentally, we determine that higher frequencies, this is for most substances, this isn't generally true, but it's for most natural things, imply a larger index of refraction, which gives more bending. So that is, blue light bends more for a given uh, substance than, it's, say, red light, lower frequency. And the way we can see this is by using a prism. So I'm going to show you a video uh, that demonstrates this. At least I think it demonstrates it. Um, I haven't watched this video in like in some in some time. So let me share my screen. Go to YouTube. Hits a piece of glass. Uh, Actually, we can just watch this whole thing. This is a good video. When a beam of light hits a piece of glass straight on, it passes right through it. Can you guys hear this, by the way? But the waves... Can you guys hear it? Yeah, we can hear it. Okay, good. ...that make up the light actually get slowed down by the glass and only go back to their normal speed when they come out the other side. That slowing down is what causes white light to split into a rainbow of colour happens because glass slows some colors of light more than others and because slowing down on an angle makes light bend. It's easy to understand the bending if you picture how the light waves would look from above, like how waves at the beach look if you see them from the air. And while white light's made up of all the different colors of light, it also helps to look at them one color at a time. When a wave front of red light hits glass on an angle, the part of the wave that enters the glass first gets slowed down before the rest. And like how waves bend around a cliff. Violet light gets slowed down even more by glass, so its waves bend more. All the other colours get bent somewhere in between. So the colours get separated when they first enter the glass on an angle and they spread out even more when they speed up on an angle as they leave. The reason that different colours slow down different amounts in glass has the longest wavelength, followed by orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and finally violet with the shortest wavelength. And the shorter the wavelength, the longer it takes to travel through glass. That's because light interacts with electrons in the molecules that make up glass. Long wavelength light, like red, only interacts a bit with the electrons, so it doesn't get slowed much. But shorter wavelength violet light 
interact more, so it gets slowed down more. So it's the combination of hitting glass on an angle and different wavelengths interacting with the electrons in the glass different amounts that makes light hitting a prism spread out into a beautiful spectrum of colour and some classic album cover art. So that's the, I mean, I would show you this example with a prism, but I don't have a prism handy. So that's why I wanted to show you that. So, so this is like the most obvious demonstration of uh, dispersion. You pass light through at an angle uh, through, or you, you pass light into a different medium at an angle, then you can let it leave that medium at an angle as well. And what ends up happening is because they bend different amounts, the light splits up. And this is how you end up with prisms splitting light. Um, by the way, this is actually how uh, Isaac Newton discovered infrared light. I think, it, yeah, I'm pretty sure it was, it was Isaac Newton. He was using prisms. He was splitting the, uh, he was splitting sunlight. Sunlight's uh, red, you know, it's, it's white. So it splits into the, all the colors of the rainbow. And he saw that a prism split it into, you know, there's purple on one side and, or I guess, violet on one side and then red on the other side. Now, the, the story goes is that he had a thermometer a mercury thermometer at the time, sitting next to his experiment. He wasn't using it yet. He was going to measure the different temperatures of light because he thought that it had different temperatures. But the thermometer was sitting outside of the uh, outside of the rainbow. He saw on on his you know table. He saw the rainbow. He saw you know violet over here, and then you know green here, and then red here. And he had his thermometer you know sitting over here. whatever a thermometer looks like. And he's like, okay, so I, I'm not, it, it's not touching the light. So the light, so it should just be at room temperature. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sharing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, so here you have, so, so he saw like, here's his table. He's splitting the light. He ends up with violet on one side. Then he has green in the middle and then red on the other side. And he put his thermometer off to the side. So, so that his intuition told him, well, the light's not hitting the thermometer. So this should just be room temperature to get a control. By the way, this is a story. I don't know if it's actually true, but um, but he found instead that the thermometer actually increased in temperature. In fact, it increased in, increased in temperature more than if you put it in the violet, green, or red parts. And that's what led him to suspect that there was another type of light that he couldn't see that was still falling on the thermometer. And that type of light heated up the thermometer more than the other types of light. That type of light turned out to be infrared light. It does turn out that glass We can see. Light happens to be absorbed pretty well by uh, glass. And so, um, and so what happened is that this, the infrared light that he couldn't see, the, uh, the infrared light that he couldn't see was heating up this glass. And so that's how he discovered that there's more to the, to the, uh, to the light that's emitted by the sun than just the Roy G. Bibb, the rainbow. Now, this gets us to another point. Notice I just said the word rainbow. So we can actually explain how rainbows work with dispersion. So let me do my best to draw an example. Actually, you know what? Let me just share screens and show you a good example because then I don't have to draw it. Scroll down. Uh, here we go, perfect example. All right. So imagine that white, uh, imagine that there is, oh, uh, sharing wrong thing. 
There we go. No, oh, come on. There we go. OK, so imagine that you have a bunch of water droplets in the air, right? Maybe it just rained. There's a bunch of water droplets in the air. So these little circles on the right, those are our water droplets. So the sun still exists. So the sun will, is going to shine light at these water droplets. Now, some of that light's just going to pass right through, right? Because water is mostly clear. However, it, there is an interface change. Um, the light changes. Uh, the the light changes speed because it inside the water because the speed of light in water is about uh, a quarter or uh, twenty five percent slower than it is in air, and so you're going to get both a reflection and diffraction. So uh, off of these interfaces. So clearly, when the top ray hits the top uh, water droplet, some of it will reflect off going up into the sky. We don't care about that because that, that light doesn't get to us on the ground. This eyeball, this person, or that, that eyeball, imagine it's a person standing on the ground. So the light is coming from behind the person, and the water droplet is uh, in front of the person. So the, the first reflection goes off into the sky. The person doesn't see it. But then some of it's going to transmit through the water droplet. Now, of the light that transmits through the water droplet, again, some of it will pass through. It's going to bend different amounts, by the way, because the index of refraction is different for red and blue light. Some of it will pass through, but those don't get to our person. So we only care about the light that gets to our person, the light rays that get to our person. So then the light rays are going to bounce off of the inside of the water droplet. They're going to reflect. Um, and then they'll pass out through the water droplet again. Um, back towards the person. Now, the blue light from the top water droplet has a less steep angle than the red light, just from the geometry of the water droplet, the roughly spherical water droplet. And so if you have two light rays, the red light from the top right light, right, the red light from the top water droplet will get to your eyeball, and the blue light from the bottom water droplet will also get to your eyeball. So what it appears for the person that is observing the sky is it looks like that the red light comes from higher up. From, so, so if you're looking straight, it comes from a higher angle than the blue light, which comes from a less high angle. And so what you end up seeing is, uh, OK, there's no picture here. What you end up seeing as, a, uh, as an observer looking forward is the following. Uh, let me draw a picture. Uh, draw. So here's you. You're looking forward. And you would see that the blue light comes from a, oh god, did I just forget it? Uh, the blue light comes from a, from a lower position. So there's going to be blue light here. And then we can fill in the gaps. You have blue light. Uh, and then, you know, there's red light up top. But the green light will be somewhere in between them. So you have green light in the middle. Now let's see this green light. The yellow light will be somewhere between those. And what you end up with is you end up with a rainbow. And this phenomenon of angles occurs all around because the, the water, well, basically because the, um, the water droplets are everywhere. I'm going to draw this particularly well. The water droplets are everywhere. So the angle from these, from the water droplets over here, again, it's going to be a larger angle. So viewed from the, viewed from the top, here's his eyeballs. You have a water droplet that's, you know, uh, no, how do I, it's hard to draw. Yeah, no, no, this, this is fine. So the water droplets viewed from the side, let, let me, so by the way, this, this is just how you get a rainbow. That's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Oops. So, I'm gonna, so this is that. So this explains so far why you get a rainbow, why you get a like a color spectrum directly in front of you. But why? What about the sides? Well, if we view, if we now view this from above, you have your person, and they see a rainbow. Um, yeah. So so here's their eyeballs. So they'll see red over here and blue over here and green in the middle. And similarly, they'll see red over here, again, at a smaller angle, blue over here 
sorry, that's that, that's. Yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Reds on the outside, and then blues in the middle, blues in the inside. And I, you know, there should be violet on the inside and green there. And so the point is again, is that the angle between the angle that the person sees the red at is at a larger angle, just like how it's a larger angle up, it's also a larger angle to the side than blue. And so you get this part of us or this this part of a circle, this bow. And that's why the rainbow forms a half circle with the uh, the with the barrier being the horizon. Uh, why does the moon turn red during lunar eclipses? Because the red light waves are the only ones that redirect toward the moon after hitting Earth's atmosphere. Uh, I'd have to think about that for a minute. I used to know the answer, but it's not not necessarily related to this. Um, um, uh, we can talk about that after lecture, though. And so you get a bow. Now, the question that you might ask is, what about double rainbows? Well, turns out that double rainbows are the result of two internal reflections. So notice that the first rainbow was a result of light coming in, bouncing, bouncing. But you can imagine that you could have another bounce, another bounce, and then come out at a different angle, right? So when you have two internal reflections, you'll get another bow occurring at a different angle. So rainbows always occur at something like 34 degrees, or maybe it's 43 degrees. Um, yeah, I, I can't remember which one. Uh, 43 degrees, 34 degrees, it's one of those. The double rainbow will be at a different set of angles. And, that, and the reason it's so rare and the reason it's so much dimmer is because it requires multiple internal reflections rather than just one. Um, it's a result of three internal reflections rather than just one internal reflection. Now, just as a quick technical point, um, the sun always needs to be behind the observer, right? Because the sun, the light rays are coming towards the uh, towards the water droplets. And then, so we have our sun. I draw a sun like a three-year-old. You, you have your observer. And then you have water droplets in the sky. So these water droplets are the ones that cause the rainbow. So the sun has to be behind the observer. And these uh, these rainbows or these water droplets exist everywhere. And so in fact, it's just basically forming a circle around your head with its center line at your head. And that's why it's a rainbow because it's just an angle away from your vision. And that angle is fixed. It's like 30, you know what? You guys can Google it. It's like 34 degrees or 43 degrees or something. Um, And that's just because the sun basically behaves as if it's shooting a parallel beam behind your head. Um, and by the way, this is why the rainbow seems to move when you move, because the, the rainbow is relative to you. It depends on where your head is, where your eyes are. The rainbow is not at some place. You're at some place, which causes you to see a rainbow. It's a visual effect. Right. Um, So let's continue. So that's those are a whole bunch of different phenomena about refraction and reflection. Uh, so you can never reach the end of, end of the rainbow. Precisely, that's exactly it. Um, and oh, by the way, if you happen to see a rainbow while you're in the air, like on an airplane, you can actually see a full circle, which is really remarkable. And that's, that, that indicates that it actually is just a full circle. And the only reason you see a semicircle is because the rest of it would have to be below the ground. But if you're high enough up that if you look down at an angle, you still see sky, it's possible to see a full ring. And that has a name, but I don't remember what, it, what it's called, uh, that phenomenon. Um, right, so we're going to change gears slightly. We're still talking about light, but we're going to uh, move on to a different, uh, different section, different chapter. And we're going to talk about polarization. So polarization, we know all waves have polarization, so light should have polarization. This is section 3.7, by the way. Um, so the polarization of light can actually significantly affect you know, what we observe or how it interacts with matter and so on. So to understand this, we actually really need to go a little bit deeper to answer the question, how light really interacts with matter. 
So light interacts with matter because it's an electromagnetic wave. It's an EM wave. And so when light hits an object, it causes the electrons in that object to vibrate. And the reason it does that is because the electromagnetic wave in particular includes an, electri an, an electrical wave or a, an oscillation in the electric field. And as you guys probably know, electrons have charge. You probably learned this in like high school. Electrons have charge. And so they're affected by electricity. And electricity really is just uh, the electric field. And so if there is an electric field that's oscillating up and down, the electrons are going to oscillate sympathetically with that uh, ele electromagnetic wave. And so what happens is when the light wave hits the electrons, it makes those electrons vibrate. And then those electrons vibrate back because they're vibrating, they re-emit waves in various directions depending on what direction they're vibrating in. And so this is how you get reflections and transmission. So some of the, so they'll re-emit waves, some of it will go back out the way it came, and some of it will continue on through the medium. So you'll get reflections and transmissions. Now, that's how waves transmit through or transmit and reflect off of objects, but we can go even deeper talking about the direction that these waves vibrate in. So some solid, this only applies to solid media, uh, have special electronic structures, meaning that their electrons are arranged in a special way. In these, in these particulars, uh, in these particular media, the electrons can only vibrate in one direction. Um, by the way, a lot of what I'm going to tell you for physical explanations as to why things happen is going to be lies. Like uh, I, I'm, I'm sim like they're not lies in that they're completely wrong, but I'm simplifying the picture dramatically so that you guys can understand it with the level of physics that you guys have. A lot of what we're, what we're talking about here is going to require things like quantum mechanics, higher level e &M, things like that that you guys don't have. So I'm just trying to simplify it so you can get an idea as to why these phenomena occur. It is true that light waves do cause electrons to vibrate, but it's more complicated than just little uh, billiard balls moving back and forth when a light wave hits it. So this is just saying that what you're, a lot of what you're about to hear is a lie. The equations, the results, the phenomena that we're describing, those all are true and do happen, but the explanations <laughs> might not be perfect. So bear in mind. Um, so, right, so, so again, what I just said is slightly a lie, but it's mostly true that there are some examples of objects, of media, of just materials, that have a special structure that only allow the electrons to oscillate in a certain way, in a particular direction. And so what that implies is that only the electric fields that cause those vibrations, are, that, that, that cause those oscillations can pass through. Now, again, this is also a little bit of a lie. It's actually not the electric fields that cause vibrations in those directions pass through. It's actually the electric fields that cause the vibrations in the other direction pass through. Basically, if the electric field uh, causes those vibrations, then the, then the light wave is absorbed and then it doesn't pass through. But if the electric field would try to cause vibrations in a way they can't vibrate, it'll just pass right through. But that's not really relevant here, that, that it's actually the other direction. Um, the point is, is that some light waves can pass through depending on the structure or some, some light waves with oscillations in a particular direction, either this way or this way, can, uh, can pass through depending on the structure of the medium. And so this is to say, because the, the polarization of a light wave depends on the direction that the electric field is oscillating, this says that only some polarizations of light are allowed through these media. i.e. only some polarizations transmit. So these types of objects, these materials, these systems, these are called polarizers. Or, and you may know this word, polaroids. I actually don't know why they're called polaroids and how that relates to, you know, a polaroid camera. I don't, I don't actually know how those two names are related. 
presumably they're related because it uses a Polaroid inside the camera in order to produce the picture, something like that. I, I don't quite know. So the picture is as follows. Let's say that you have a, a film of this material that only lets light through that is polarized, that involves horizontal oscillations. So if a wave were to try to pass through that goes this way, it would just be stopped. Whereas if you had the same wave trying to pass through a polarizing film that allows light vertically through, that's polarized vertically, well, then the wave will just pass right through. And so, so what these do is these can basically selectively filter. This is a hor this, by the way, this would have like a horizontal polarizing axis. The polarizing axis, by the way, is the direction of light that it lets through, the direction of polarity of polarization of light that it lets through. This one would have a vertical polarizing axis. Um, so the, so the point is, is that these polarizers, these Polaroids, can act as filters for different types of polarized light. So if it's polarized one direction, it won't let it through. And if it's polarized a different direction, it will let it through. And that's powerful because we can do things with polarized light. Now, this is a simplified picture, obviously. Um, but the idea is correct, that this does happen. And if I had polarizers at home, I would show you. But I don't think that my sunglasses are, or my glasses are polarized. Uh, well, I have a video to show you later. Um, so in fact, this, this phenomenon, this is actually how three, modern three-dimensional, or not three-dimensional, modern 3D films work. So imagine that you had two glasses that, that, that you put on your set of glasses. And one in one of your glasses, you had a polarization that only allowed vertically polarized light through. And in your other lens, you had a, polariz a polarizing filter or a polarizer that only let horizontally polarized light through. Now, if somehow you could project onto the screen in front of you uh, one image that was polarized one way and another image that was polarized the other way, then you can choose which image goes to which eye. And then you can have a slightly different image that goes to your right eye from a, a slightly, or an image that's slightly different words. You could have a slightly different image going to your right eye from an image that's going to your left eye. And then you can precisely produce 3D images by basically just filtering out the image that you don't want going to the right eye uh, from the right eye using this polarizer. Now, modern 3D film, uh, mo modern 3D like glasses and stuff doesn't actually use linearly pol linear polarization. It uses something called circular polarization. And that's why it still works even if you tilt your head. But that's, that's just a technical detail. The idea is still there. Um, that you put one polarization through one eye, one polarization, the other polarization through the other eye, and then you can just choose which part of your projected image goes to which eye. Now, this, this picture that I just gave is definitely oversimplified. So there's a few points that I should clarify. So um, So let's talk about a few points. So light can be polarized about any axis, right? Not just vertical or horizontal. It can be polarized at a 45 degree angle. It can be polarized at a 10 degree angle at any angle besides just vertical and horizontal. Uh, but as long as, the, as long as the direction of polarization is perpendicular to the direction of motion. So light can be polarized about any axis perpendicular to propagation, the direction of propagation. By the way, the direction of propagation, I know I've used this language a lot, but the direction of prop propagation is the direction that the light ray is traveling. Um, <clears throat> and so the way that we handle what happens when you have, let's say, let's say you had a light wave that was polarized at a 45 degree angle passing through a vertical polarizer. Well, then does it all get blocked? Does it all get through? How do you know? Well, the way that we figure this out is we break up. We break up the electric field into parallel and perpendicular components. To the polarizing direction or to the polarizing axis.
So, um, and then one, and then the part that's parallel to the polarizing axis passes through, and the part that's perpendicular to the polarizing axis doesn't pass through. So the picture is, is you, you have your polarizer. Where does light go in the first case? Oh, in this case, it's just absorbed by the polarizer, and some of it might be reflected. Um, you can also produce reflecting Polaroids, and that is it only reflects light when a certain polarization uh, is impacts on it. But the idea is just that these are transmission Polaroids, so they only let light through if it's uh, if it's of a certain polarization, and uh, the rest is either reflected or absorbed and turned into heat. Right. So, say you have a polarizing filter that is uh, with a horizontal axis. So, if our light wave is, has a polarization that's up and to the right. This is, by, by the way, this is like viewed from the front. So you have your light wave coming in. And then we're viewing the polarization. So this is our electric field vector E. That's the direction of the polarization. Well, we can break this up into two components. You have a component that's vertical, because you can always break up vectors. We're going to call this E perp. And you have a component that's horizontal. And so this wave, or not that wave, the, this component does not pass through. That component of the electric field doesn't pass through. And this component does pass through, which is just to say that you can figure out how much, uh, so, so some of the light, if, if you're light wave is polarized, say, 45 degrees away from the horizontal. Some of the light's going to get through a horizontal polarizing axis Polaroid, and some of the light will be blocked. And you can figure out exactly how much. Now, the way that we do that is we relate the, uh, the, uh, the electric field amplitude to intensity. Remember that the amplitude of a wave, or sorry, the intensity of a wave is related to the square of the amplitude. So if the amplitude changes because our electric field, only a certain amount of the electric field makes it through, then the intensity changes. And so in particular, if the <clears throat> this actually gets us to something called Malice's law. So <clears throat> um, yeah, uh, I'm going to write this down, and then I have something else. So Malice's law tells us exactly how much gets through a polarizing filter, how much light gets through a polarizing filter when the light is polarized at an angle theta. So if the angle between the polarization axis, BW is between, sorry, if the angle between the polarization of a light source and the axis of polarization of a Polaroid is theta, then the intensity that gets through is the following formula. It's I of theta, I of theta so the intensity depends on that angle. And it's equal to I naught times cosine squared of theta. And this should look familiar. Now, why does this happen? This happens because the intensity, so the electric field can be written as the perpendicular part plus the parallel part. And only the parallel part makes it through. So that means that the, the intensity of light that gets through, or rather the, the light that gets through has an amplitude A which is equal to the magnitude of the part of light of the the magnitude of the electric field that gets through but the magnitude of the electric field that gets through is just the original magnitude times the cosine of the angle between the uh, between the polarizing direction and the original angle so it's this angle here so you can see that if theta is zero i.e if they're perfectly aligned then the amplitude of the original wave is the same as the amplitude of the final wave and that means that the intensity is the same as the maximal intensity, I naught. I naught here, again, representing the maximum intensity that can get through, which is when it's perfectly aligned. And so that is to say, intensity, which is related to the amplitude squared, 
is therefore proportional to the cosine squared of the angle. That's where this formula comes from. That's where Malice's law comes from. And the pro proportionality is just, well, when the angle is uh, when the angle is zero, it should be all of it. So the intensity should be the maximum intensity when the angle is zero, and the intensity should be zero when the angle is 90 degrees. So try it. Plug in 90 degrees for theta, i.e. when the when the uh, direction, when the polarization of the electric field is perpendicular to the polarizing filter, well then cosine of 90 degrees is zero and I naught squared times zero is zero. So you get no light through. And when <coughs> theta is zero, when it is aligned, you get uh, you get I, I of zero degrees is zero, is, is I naught, it's the maximum amount. And you can figure out all the angles in between. <coughs> now there's one more phenomenon that occurs. Um, and that's uh, that not all light is polarized. Not all light from a single source has the same polarization. And we call light that has this property where you have a bunch of light waves that aren't polarized in the same direction for coming from a single source, we call it uh, we call that type of light unpolarized just because there's no one defined polarization. And so this would be like a light bulb, like a standard halogen light bulb emits light of all of the different frequencies and all of the different polarizations. So it just there's just light. E even if you have two waves of the same frequency, they'll be polarized in you know random directions. And it has polarizations of all of the directions. And so the consequence of this is that half of unpolarized light makes it through, makes it through a polarizing filter. exactly half. And so this is to say that the intensity drops by 50% because half of it makes it through, half of it doesn't make it through. And now the light that comes out of the polarized polarizer is polarized because only the, um, only the light, only the component of the electric fields that are in that direction actually get through. And so all of the light that comes out of the filter is already polarized. And the intensity of that light is exactly one half of the intensity of the incoming light, the incoming, um, uh, the incoming unpolarized light. So let me show you something really spooky and then we'll call it, call it a day. So this is a demo that I would love to do in class, but I can't or live because I don't have these. Um, this is a, uh, what happens when you have three polarizing filters? And by the way, what you're about to see is actually a quantum effect, um, or rather it's a demonstration of a quantum effect, but it's really just a result of Malice's law. So let's see. Here I'm playing around a polarized light. Sunlight is unpolarized, so it doesn't really matter what angle that- uh, So, the, I, so I, he's I, using sunlight here. Polarizing filter. You have two filters and they're polarized in the same direction, then essentially nothing, uh, nothing too interesting happens. If the polarizers cross, then essentially I, uh, light making it through one filter is uh, horizontally polarized. Then the next filter only lets through the, the light that's vertically polarized. So cumulatively, nothing makes it through. This is used to have adjustable uh, filters in uh, uh, photography fairly often. Now, something really interesting starts to happen. And in fact, a, a quantum effect uh, begins to kick in if I ask three questions. So surprisingly, the order, the answer I get depends on the order that I ask the questions. So if I, uh, if I have a uh, horizontally, diagonally, and then vertically polarized, I get a different answer than if I ask horizontal, uh, horizontal, vertical, or horizontal, vertical, vertical. So in between, uh, I actually get a lot more uh, light transmission than you would expect. And this is a this is an angular dependent uh, uh, sort of transmission. So it has to be between the asking the horizontal and asking the vertical question that I ask this diagonal question. And uh, this is really a quantum effect. So if I ask the photons the same questions in a different order, I actually get a different answer, which seems a little disturbing to me.
So he says that it's disturbing, that it's a quantum effect. And it, it, I mean, in a sense it is, it's a very cool thing. It is, it is very interesting. But the reason he thinks it's quantum is because he is thinking about light in terms of photons. Now, the whole quantum business involves wave particle duality. So you can think about light in terms of photons or in terms of waves. But if you view it from the perspective of waves, it's not very surprising. And the reason why it's not very surprising is because you have your first filter, say you have, you have your light wave coming in. Let's say your light wave is oscillating originally up and down. It passed, or it, it's, a, it's oscillating, sorry, it's unpolarized light, right? So you have oscillations in all of the directions. And then you pass through a horizontal filter. So then you only get light that comes through that's horizontally polarized. Now, if you put another filter over here that's vertically polarized, well, then nothing, right? That's what, that's what we saw. With two filters, one perpendicular to the other, you get nothing. But what if, what if instead of this setup, what if you had something in between? Well, if you put something in between, let's say it's 45 degrees, well, now some of this light, as we saw from Malice's law, some of the light, because it's only off by a 45 degree angle, some of this light will go through and it'll be polarized at an angle. The light that comes out from a polarizer is always polarized at the, ang or at the angle as, as the polarizer. Um, and so then when we get to the vertical, vertically oriented um, polarizer, now, again, this is at a 45 degree angle. So we can get vertical pol polarization through. And so the weird thing is that if you imagine these as photons that have a distinct polarization, then it seems like somehow the polarization is changing depending on, uh, depending on whether there's something in the middle. But if you think of these just as waves and the waves are being absorbed by the electrons and then they're being re-emitted by the electrons in, a, in, in the direction that they're allowed to be emitted in, then it's not so spooky because all that's happening is the polarizers can only emit light in the direction, or they can only let light through that is in the direction of the uh, polarizing of, in, of the polarizing filter, and so the the polaroids themselves are the things rotating the polarization. And so by adding in an intermediate step, you're allowing it to complete this full rotation. And in fact, you can have more and more filters at more and more intermediate angles, and you can allow more and more light through. In fact, this is going to be a homework problem. Um, <clears throat> uh, calculating it in the in the infinite limit. It's not too hard though. So um, I think I'm going to end it there. There was this notion of uh, polarization by reflection that I didn't get to get to. And I was definitely going to lie to you about that. But I actually might just skip all of that material because I think that that material is horribly confusing. And it's not super illuminating. Maybe I'll just talk about it for a few minutes on uh, next week. But anyway, I'm going to end lecture here. Um, and I'll take questions.